Hello and welcome back to the Job Hunter podcast, your one-stop shop for finding out about some of the UK's more interesting careers. This week we'll be exploring what goes into making some of the UK's most iconic cars, as well as what makes JLR such a great place to work. So without further ado, let's jump into today's show. This week on the Job Hunter podcast, we'll be exploring the fascinating world that is the car industry in the UK. My next guest is part of one of Britain's most iconic brands, Jaguar Land Rover. Known for producing some of the most recognisable British cars ever made. The Jaguar E-Type, the original Land Rover and the Go Anywhere workhorse, the Defender. It's a pleasure to welcome James Grant to the Job Hunter podcast. Um, why don't we kick things off by finding a little bit more about what you do at JLR, James? Hi, Tim. Yeah, so what do I do at JLR? So my role is a vehicle integration engineer. Um, and essentially what we're responsible for is it's sort of like engineering project management. So right from the uh, start of the car where we're setting the targets, and that's really basic stuff like how fast it should go, how much it should weigh, um, you know, what sort of size are we looking to go for? Um, we project manage all of the engineering development from that stage right to the full vehicle sign off. Um, and that, that's quite a long process, you know, on a, on a brand new car that can be about five years. So it's quite a long cycle, but uh, it's very interesting. It means I get to see lots of different bits of the business. Um, and ultimately you feel quite responsible for the product, which is, which is really rewarding. So you actually get to decide how quick a car goes. Is that like, do you, do you base that off some data or do you just pick a number out of your head and go, Oh, I want it to do 252 miles an hour today. There's, 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 there's two key bits you look at. One is your competitive positioning. So you'll know for whatever car you want to do, what your key competitors are. And then based off that, you'll already have an idea of what technologies you're going to deploy. And it's, it's, it's a balance between the two, um, as in where do you want to sit in the marketplace? What technologies can you deploy? Um, and what other attributes are there that will get impacted by it? Um, so to give you an example, something like a Defender, actually acceleration is not something we're too worried about, but there's a good balance between acceleration and um, if you're talking about your gearbox, for good acceleration it's not always going to give you off-road performance so there's a bit of a balance in that in in those sort of cars and if you're talking about one of the jag products the balance will go completely differently and you'd be looking for for, for, yeah, for, for performance rather than you know other attributes that, that are less important than those cars so for for some of those listeners that might not be as uh, savvy with their car makers um who exactly are Jaguar Land Rover? You, you've obviously got two famous British brands in the name, um, but where does that come from? So Jaguar and Land Rover were both um, uh, created as separate companies. They existed as separate companies for quite a long time. Um, and then they were brought together under British Leyland. And the, the famous bit is when they were bought, both bought by Ford. So Ford had this premier automotive group that included Aston Martin and Volvo, um, amongst others. And then in, uh, I think it was about 2007, they were sold to Tata. Um, so Tata is the, the big Indian conglomerate that are uh, well known for you know, Tata Steel, et cetera. Um, and there are some really useful synergies between having two British brands. You know, they said that share the same sort of ethos behind them. Um, but from a uh, brand point of view, actually, from an engineering side, it's quite useful to be able to combine them together. Um, and when Tata bought them together, you know, since then, the, the number of cars we produced has, has increased by a huge amount. Um, and they're still two separate cars. You still go into a dealership and there'll be one side that's Jaguar and one side that's Land Rover, but they're under the same roof. Um, so it's two distinct brands, but, but one ultimately engineering team that, that sits behind it. So does that mean on, on the production line, you've, you've got you know, a Defender going down the track and then you've got a, um, you know, a F type, and then you've got a uh, discovery, or do you have separate places that you build all these different cars? So it's not quite that close together, but there are some plants. So in Solihull, for example, um, on the production line there, you will see, you know, a Jaguar followed by a Range Rover. Um, you know, that is, that's generally what you'll see, but most of the other plants are split. Um, and it's a historical thing based upon what they've traditionally made. Um, and you tend to keep it that way. So Castle Bromwich is where it's traditionally a Jag plant. Um, Halewood up in Merseyside near Liverpool is traditionally a Land Rover plant. And, and at the moment, 
there's no crossover there. Now that doesn't mean there won't be in the future. Um, I honestly don't know where the company is going to go with its manufacturing footprint, but um, there's always the potential. And if we can, I'm sure they would like it so that we can build more flexibly than we can at the moment. Excellent. I'm sure we'll touch a bit more on the, the making process and where you fit into that role in a little bit. Um, before we get to that, I'd love to find out um, where did this bug for cars uh, really start for you? Where did where do you kind of know that you wanted to be involved with cars in some capacity? Yeah, so I think, to be fair, there were probably two key influences behind it all. Um, one is my dad, who's also a car nut. Um, and, you know, ever since I was young, he always had car magazines and he always had interesting cars and we used to go to the motor show and stuff. Um, and I think through all of that, you know, the, uh, I just got bitten by the bug, you know, um, I like going fast, whether that be in, in this or, you know, where we met in skiing, um, you know, there's, there's a bit of an adrenaline side behind it all. Um, and I think, you know, cars, cars are good fun. They're quite an emotive product. Um, the other side is my grandfather was always very keen in getting me involved with fixing things. Um, you know, I've, I've loved Lego as a kid, still do now, to be honest. Um, and actually building things, working out how they work, how do things go together, how can you make things better? Um, that was all that was all come from my grandfather. Um, and combining those two together is, is ultimately how I've ended up where I am now. So you really had that kind of engineering mindset from a very early age to to be a problem solver uh yeah I've, i would say so to an extent you know um there's definitely people who you meet who you think well you know they're really um quite passionate about you know one or the other but but certainly combining them together then yeah i think that's something that's that's always sat with me um, so interestingly then um at what point did you kind of know then that you wanted to pursue this properly because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a dustbin lorry man, a dustbin lorry driver, not the dustbin man, but the lorry driver. Um, and actually, I, I never knew what I wanted to do in my life. And I probably still never do uh, actually know what, what I want my career to be. But was yeah. there a point where you kind of went, right, I actually really want to get on with this. And how did you how did you decide where where to go? Um, that's a good question. Where did it where would it all have started? Probably uh, the interesting cars had always been there. Um, wanting to combine that with engineering happened later on, and it was probably about the time where you started looking at university courses. Um, from the A levels I did, I was sort of torn between either going and doing economics or something like that, um, mm. or doing engineering. Um, and and it was the engineering that ultimately won out. Um, and I was very fortunate, you know, at uni I did automotive engineering. And that gave you a great basis for them you know, entering the automotive industry um, and, you know, invent a lot of the modules that you need to take the stuff that actually is very applicable for work. And you did a, a placement year, right, didn't you, between your third well, and fourth year? Yeah. So uh, this is, you know, how did I get into JLR? I was really quite fortunate. Um, I first applied for JLR in my first year of uni. So I'd done, I'd done three months at uni at the time. Um, and I applied for the, uh, at the time it would have been a three month undergrad placement. Um, and I got in, I think off the back of some, cause I hadn't done any uni exams at that point. So was, at that point it was off the back of some strong A levels. Um, and being able to display that I was quite passionate about it all. So, um, I managed to get in for a summer placement. Um, so that was been first and second year of uni. I then did another summer placement. Then I did a year's placement. Um, and it meant that going to final year of uni, I'd already had three different jobs at JLR. Um, and so, you know, at that point, it was quite easy for me to go back on the grad scheme. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very fortunate way of entering the, the industry, if I'm honest. You know, some people have to have, to have a more difficult route in. Um, I was very lucky that, uh, you know, I was able to successfully apply in that first place. And it's something that I've tried to give back a bit. So at work, I'm the... Uh, campus lead for Loughborough so when we do all of our recruitment events I lead the team that go to Loughborough and we speak to all of the different university um, schools and we go to the careers fairs and we try and engage with uh, students to get them involved um, you know and, and that ultimately was what got me in the, in the door in the first place so it's it's good to be able to give something back as well though. And do you think that's a really good route then to to get into some of these bigger businesses that are quite competitive right you know some of these graduate schemes are very 
subscribed in terms of applicants, but it's maybe a lesser known route to to go through the, yeah. the summer internship programs. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wholeheartedly support the the idea, and certainly at JLR, you know, if you've done a summer um, or a year's undergraduate placement, you get preference on the grad scheme spots. So, um, you know, obviously where recruitment is constricted this year, coronavirus hasn't meant we've been able to recruit in the same number that we did, although we still recruited quite a few from my understanding. Um, the people who've done undergrad placements, but they've got first dibs on all those spots. Um, and I think you'll find across the industry, you know, that's that's quite common practice. Places like Rolls Royce, um, I think it was Rolls Royce and um, British Rail. I'm sure they actually said they weren't recruiting any grads because they were just going to get their undergraduate pool and just recycle them. So um, it's it's a really good way into companies if you know what you want to do. Um, doing undergrad placement is a, is a really good way of getting your foot in the door and getting people there to know who you are as well. Because it means when you come back, you've got all these skills that people don't actually expect you to have. And uh, you, so you mentioned you've done a f you did a few different jobs at JLR before you even started properly. Um, what sort of stuff can you get exposed to at kind of um, a very tender age at university? Yeah. And what what's on offer for people who are potentially wanting to get involved in the car industry? Because there's so much more to it than just engineering uh, per se, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, I was I was very fortunate that when I went and did that first placement, I had a really good management team um, who were keen to get me involved in stuff. So we built some prototype cars and basically I was responsible for defining all of the bits that we needed to give to the build team to, to get these cars built. Um, and, you know, you do other other jobs with other people and you do quite a bit of shadowing so you understand how the business operates. Um, that sort of experience is actually coming really good stead for when I've then returned on subsequent placements because you say, oh, actually, you know, I know someone who can help me out here. I've got experience of doing this. Um, and it means that, you know, you can bring a useful skill to a team, um, which is always which is always good. Um, and there's, a, you know, I got to do a huge variety of things, you know, from one of the placements, yeah, was, was doing those prototype car builds on another placement. I was working with a team who, um, responsible for engineering the dampers and we got to go to a supplier up near Preston um, and they um, were testing the dampers on these you know enormous rigs um, you know and it's, it's those classic ones that you see in sort of uh, promo materials if you're within the engineering you know community um, and it was quite impressive but then they took us into the next room and there was a bendy bus on one of these at that point it would have been like an eight post rig um going through a full suspension cycle and you know you stand there and watch that and you're like that is that's really quite impressive stuff um because essentially there's you know whatever company designs buses i've, I've got a clue who does it from that scanning or somewhere and uh you know they've got this bus sat on this rig that is doing you know the equivalent of a bus life cycle in you know a number of weeks rather than a number of years um and that sort of stuff's quite impressive i, I personally i like to work at a vehicle level um, rather than component level, that's what that placement taught me. But it's a, it's a great example of doing those summer placements can equally tell you what you don't like. Um, that is a really, really good point um, that sometimes doing a bit of experience um, and getting that under your belt can help to define where you want to go. Um, you know, I, I think I was quite similar. We we actually lived together, didn't we, on our yeah. um, year, years out? And I was doing a, a completely different job to you, but it was uh, not the path I wanted to go down. And, and that definitely helped me. But um, I was just going to say it's um, an important point to say that working at JLR gives you the exotic travel highlights, such as going to Preston and uh, other places in the yeah, north. So I, I mean, can't be... yeah, that's... Sniff that. uh, one of the highlights uh where else have we got to go yeah there's a lot you know the local area of coventry and birmingham you can oh, go lots of areas around there so beautiful, uh, beautiful. yeah i mean it, equally um you know i the role i do doesn't permit me to go and do international travel but there are people on the grand scheme who have gone to spain they've gone to sweden um before the whole coronavirus uh came around they used to go to the us quite a bit so um depending on your role there's definitely the opportunity to go to these sorts of places yeah. excellent fantastic um so as we come back to more the the nitty-gritty of how you build a car you mentioned that the, the 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 cycle to go from the drawing board and the the, the you know the decision making stage through to a car actually rolling off the production line is is about five years right um what is that if you could in 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 
in brief terms what is that whole process then where what different stages and and hoops um does the car metaphorically have to jump through to to jump off the page of of the designer's um drawing board and and into the you know the reality of having four wheels and an engine yeah yeah so to start off with it's, it's all about target setting so before you've decided you know the the um details on the car you want to talk about the fundamentals you know where are you going to put the engine what's your engine range going to be what what are you targeting how big do you want the car to be um and you start at quite a high level defining all of these things and slowly through the engineering process you get more and more detailed in all of your design work um and these days it gets ever more complicated because there's more regulations that you've got to go through you know you look at the old, old defender for example the crash test that that had to pass let's be honest, we're not particularly thorough um, these days to get a car to, you know, a five-star Euro NCAP rating is really quite arduous. Um, and you've got to do it to be competitive. It comes back to that, you know, where do you want to sit against your competitors? Um, you know, and people like Volvo, for example, have made their name out of being, making safe cars. Um, and they really go down that route. And because they do, pretty much everyone else has to follow. Um, so you spend a lot of time defining that. There's then a lot of virtual work. Um, and these days, with the technologies available, you know, your CF, CFD, uh, CAE, so computer-aided engineering, the simulations you can run, you can get quite a long way through a development cycle without building any physical parts. Um, and that's something certainly you couldn't used to be able to do. Um, but these days, you, know, you, can get, you can get a substantial, you probably, before you built your first car, you would probably be two or three years into that five-year process you know before you before you built any parts it will all have been virtual um and then you start building the prototype cars and that's where you start to see um the spy shots in your, your top gear and your auto car magazines and you know there's a car with weird bits of bodywork and camouflage patterns on it that's gone to the Nürburgring is a classic example you know we, we everyone sends cars there they do industry pool days and the photographers sit on the side and just take photos of every car they see um, and send it to the mags so you build your cars and that prototype phase is all about validating what you've done virtually um, you know if you if you did a specific test uh, in uh, computer aided engineering if you go and do it in the real world does it match that um, and over time you get better and better it's a bit of a virtuous circle you do some tests you might work out that you see you need a bit of tweak so the next program along it gets a bit better um, and it's an area that I think across the industry is, is only going to grow um and it means that you start making these production vehicles later and later on so it costs you less money um, and it's quicker to make engineering changes because changing a part in a you know a CAD model is the work of i don't know maybe a day uh changing a physical part if you've got to take tooling to it you're talking months as a minimum generally. um and then once you've gone through all of that you've done all your physical work you'll have signed the car off you then got to take it to mass production you've got to change the factory and and introduce any new parts that you want into the factory or processes or operations and then you get the car out the end of it and you know there will again be iterative loops to build the quality of the product before you then launch it to the consumers um, but it's 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 quite rewarding to see the car grow and grow throughout that process um, and ultimately when the car gets revealed it's quite a proud moment for the whole team you know it's, it's five years is a significant part of most people's lives um, and then to be able to stand at the end and say, actually, you know, we played a really significant role in that is, is great. And you get people, you know, who are equally passionate about the parts that they've designed. So I personally haven't designed any parts on a car. Um, I've been involved in the decision making and the trade between, you know, do we want the car to go around corners better? Do we want it to be better off road? Uh, do we want it to be quieter? Do we want it to be lighter? There's those sort of trades that we'll get involved in. But, you know, you get some people who have been involved in they can actually say, you know, you know that that bumper or um, those headlights. I actually designed those, and they get to see it on every car. And for some people, that's that's more rewarding. Um, but yeah, it's 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 not a quick process. Um, although it is quicker than the uh, space industry, which I think is about like thirty years from from drawing boards to seeing a plane in the air. So uh, you know, it's all relative. Yeah, I imagine that's uh, you probably have people who were born and died in that <laughs> in that period of time, can't you? Um... But I think uh, no, that's that's probably a really uh, key part of working for for any company is feeling a bit of pride in what you do, isn't it? I, 
remember my in a former life um i also worked in the automotive industry for a for another um car maker and that was definitely something that i found very uh rewarding was you 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 know that something you've worked on specifically is is there on a customer's car and will always be there in that design process and um knowing that you've done a good job is is kind of a really good feeling isn't it um yeah but they're very emotional they're a very emotional purchase you know after a house a car is someone's second most expensive purchase unless they own a boat or something um and so it means that people pay put a lot of effort into making those decisions and so actually if you to put something out there that someone then goes and spends a you know substantial sum of money on um you know it's it's a really it's a really rewarding experience to be able to see that actually happen does it ever make you laugh i, I remember one of the things that really made me laugh was compare it like looking at what was rumored on on the new bit like new car that was coming out and seeing how wild they can sometimes be and you just think my goodness if they actually knew like what was on it they they yeah they'd be so wide of the mark does that ever make you giggle like some of the things you've oh, seen oh definitely yeah, yeah yeah i mean so one of my one of my undergrad projects was when we did range Rover the bar um it's got uh, deployable door handles that when you drive along sit flush to the car um and there were rumors of, of this you know happening in the automotive press but when we made the prototypes we stuck on fake door handles to the outside um and it made us all it made us all really chuckle because you saw uh, the cars driving along with these fake door handles on and you know auto car would take a photo and all the comment section would be like oh auto car said in this article it was going to have you know deployable door handles but look there's real ones on it and we all sat there going ah we got you um <laughs> And that's, that's that sort of stuff that actually is, you know, is, is, is a bit of entertainment along the way. But on the flip side, is is it quite hard sometimes when you want to be able to, you know, not brag necessarily, but you, you show pride in what you're doing and you and want to tell people, you know, if someone asks you, oh, how's your day? What have you been up to? And you're kind of like, I can't really talk too much about it. And it, does that kind of not affect you, but you kind of went, God, I wish I could just be a bit more normal in some respects. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it, it, if you're in a, a product led industry, you're always going to get that, you know, the services sector, possibly not so much. Um, although ultimately, you know, even if there's a, a, you know, a new banking system or something that's going to be developed and stuff behind that. Um, it, 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 it does great a little bit, but equally it's quite rewarding to be like, I know what's coming, you know, um, I know what, you know, we're going to release next year and the year after that and, and no one else does and you know it's it's it's, it's quite cool knowing that you know that, that's one of the perks i suppose for a car not working in the car industry that's one of the perks is being like you know i know what that's going to look like when it comes out no one else does or no one outside the jlr does you know, there's forty thousand people who potentially do but outside that small pool of people no one else knows and you end up speaking in codes, don't you? I remember all, all my colleagues, we'd we'd speak in whispered uh, code names for all the different cars and whatever, and it'd just be this own second language of, a uh, lot of it would be random German words in my instance, but um, speaking in, in random in random terms that no one would understand unless you were in, in that inner loop and that kind of, you had that kind of satisfaction of knowing that you knew and no one else knew kind of thing. Yeah, yeah the, the automotive industry, and I think engineering industries love an acronym. Um, you know, uh, working from home is really interesting because uh, my girlfriend will sit in the other room and I will be talking in a meeting with other people. We'll all know what we're talking about, <laughs> but honestly, she wouldn't have a clue what's going on. And um, she's, she's quite knowledgeable about cars, but the way that we end up speaking about them at work is, is just completely foreign to anyone who's not within the company. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure it's like that where you worked as well. You know, it's, it's, one of those things that, and then you just tune into it and it just becomes second nature. Um, and then when you come to speak to people outside, once it's all been revealed, you start thinking, okay, so that's what we called it inside, but what's the actual name that we, we've told the, you know, the public we're going to call it. Um, and that's always, that's always quite entertaining as well because we have all these code names, but within the company, we don't know what badge we're going to be sticking on the back of the car. Uh, you know, for some we do, you know, Defender was always going to be Defender. Um, but Ranger of Valar is a classic one. I didn't know what that was going to be called till the moment we revealed it and everyone else in the public knew. Yeah, and, and ultimately a lot of those decisions, you know, like I said, get made quite late by some some of the higher ups. And um, and yeah. It, yeah, it's almost as exciting for us because my experience of it was you'd never see the full project unless you were privy to those, you know, 
big meetings or whatever, you'd be focusing on your little bit of it. And so the launches would be equally as exciting because, you know, you might have seen some concept shots or something like that, but it's not the same as, as seeing the, the, the finished article. And, and th those are really exciting because at least where I work, you have these big flashy uh, reveals and stuff like that, or live streams and stuff like that. And um, it was, uh, it was really an exciting thing. So yeah, it's, it, that's another thing I enjoyed most was just actually getting to, to, to see what you would be working on for years and years. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's a really, that's another bit that's, that's quite cool, you know, and, and, one of the things that I'm fortunate about with my role is that I get to see the whole vehicle from quite an early stage. Um, but in a company at JLR size, I get to see my, you know, the project I work on, I get to see the whole vehicle from an early stage, but I don't get to see any of the others. So, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting industry to work in because you'll only ever see your company, you'll never see a small part of it. Um, and the industry is huge. You know, there are, there are hundreds of car companies around the world these days. Um, and each one of them will have a very similar development cycle. So um, there's loads of people out there who know, know what's coming in the next five, 10, 15 years. Um, and it's quite interesting to be one of those for, for a very small area of the market. That kind of leads me very nicely onto my next question. Um, and I'm not going to ask you anything specific about what you guys have got coming up. I feel that would be unfair to you and potentially would put us all in some hot water. So I'll avoid that. But it's very clear that there's, a, there's an obvious push by by governments and by people to, you know, look after our planet a bit better, um, reduce our carbon emissions, stuff like that. Where do you see the car industry going in the next 10 to 15 years? Do you think it's one of those where we're just going to suddenly give up on petrol and the internal combustion engine completely, even though there's all these regulations that say we should, um, or, you know, is it a bit of a case of when we got the motor car, um, horses got, you know, moved into the realms of sports and sport and, and racing and, and that's where they stayed or are we, are we destined for noiseless electric vehicles that all just plod around on their own? I think, it's a really difficult one to predict. You know, the, I think the automotive industry now is seeing the biggest change it's ever seen. You know, you, you look at a car from the 50s and you look at the car from, say, 2000. And yeah, the, you know, uh, infotainment system is sat nav and your stereo might have improved. But ultimately, you've got a petrol engine, you'll have a manual gearbox. And, you know, there'll be a different from some wheels and a bit of bodywork. Conceptually, it's pretty, pretty common. Um, and I think that's going to change pretty quickly. Um, we're going to see, you know, there's legislation that's forcing companies to move in a certain direction and then move, force you know, people towards electric cars. Um, I think it's going to be a quite some while before we see, you know, lots and lots of people in the mainstream. Um, no, bear with us. We're getting a, a visit. <laughs> right, more, pets, the, more pets, the, uh, the better. Yeah. So, um, He's a huge car fan. He was quite happily sat watching the F1 at the weekend. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's, there's a huge shift in the industry. I think um, hybrids are going to become very popular. You know, I think the modern plug-in hybrid is a really good solution to um, modern transportation problems. Just bear with me. I'm going to chuck in. I'm just going to remove the cat. <laughs> Um, he's a nightmare. He does this when I work from home as well. Um, yeah, but the, the modern plug-in hybrid is a really good um, solution to, to travel because you can use the electric on um, local journeys and then if you need to go further, you've got an internal combustion engine. At the moment, battery electric cars are somewhat compromised and I think you'll struggle to find many families where they only own an electric car. My dad's got an electric car and his partner has a car with a conventional engine in it. Because if they want to come, you know, go down to Cornwall or something, they'll use that because otherwise they've got to stop on the way down. Um, that's not necessarily an issue with the technology though, that's the infrastructure a lot uh, in a lot of it's a bit respects. of both. It's a bit of both. I think the the key thing that will open up the electric car market is is charging um, and charge times. Yeah. Um and technologically, that's quite challenging, you know, to manage the thermal capacity of the, of the thermal um, ability of the battery to take on so much charge in a short period of time 
is quite challenging. Um, and then you've got to get the infrastructure to, to catch up. So I think it's it's going to come, it's going to happen. You know, the governments across the world have said they're going to ban the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, it's just going to take a while to get there, I think. I think we'll, we'll get to the point of uh, 2030 in the UK and you might not be able to buy uh, internal combustion engine cars, but there'll still be a lot on the roads. Um, and that switch over from them coming off the roads is, is going to take a while. Um, and you asked whether we're going to see the, the death of internal combustion engines much like, or, or to move to recreation like we did with you know, horses back in the very early days of the automobile. And I think we probably will. Um, but there's interesting work being done by people like Porsche at the moment who have partnered, um, I think it's with Siemens, in um, in uh, artificial um, hydrocarbon fuels. So they're synthesizing hydrocarbon fuels, um, which is really quite interesting. And they sell the, say the whole well to wheel emissions um, is comparable to a um, electric car. Now that's a really interesting point because you're then opening up something Yeah, you've got to make these fuels, but the infrastructure for getting in people's cars is already there. Um, and that's a huge part of the problem that's already been solved. So that I think is going to probably be the solution for sports car manufacturers. Some racing, although I think there's an increased amount of racing where they're saying, let's put batteries in them for now and we'll see where it goes. Um, and that will be the answer for, um, for you know, uh, Sunday cars and, and, and cars that people have as a toy rather than as a necessity to get to work and back. Um, and then the other big one's hydrogen, um, which you know, is even more difficult to set up the infrastructure for. Um, comes with its own unique challenges uh, in terms of uh, developing the car. But you know, JLR, we've come out and we said, you know, we want to try and get hydrogen cars on the road. Uh, you can go to your um, Hyundai dealership and you can buy a fuel cell car. Um, but there's not many of them because they're difficult to refuel. Uh, so at the moment, there's no silver bullet, if I'm honest. Um, I think electric cars is probably going to be a good intermediary step. But you look at the technological roadmaps that people put out, and I I think there's a lot of wishful thinking behind some of them. I'm sure we could uh, do a whole another podcast on yeah. future cars and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, it's one of those where no, we've opened no one's got Pandora's, the answers for it. <laughs> a Pandora's yeah. box. Um, so I'll probably um, move us along a little bit. We'll take a slight segue again away from the world of cars and in, into Tim's three tips, the segment of the show that is probably the most contentious in my own head of being the worst named section of any podcast ever. But by the by, we'll continue. Um, so... For those that may not know, Tim's Three Tips is the uh, part of the show where we ask our expert guests to give um, three bits of advice, three tip bits uh, that could help you in your everyday life. Um, as you are an expert in in all things cars, or at least you like to think so, uh, from my knowledge, um, why don't you ask uh, James um, the hypothetical, you're running late for work, it's absolutely freezing outside, absolutely Baltic, and your car won't start. Um, what's three bits of advice you could give to someone who's listening um, to potentially fix their their car related issue? Yeah, I mean that's so that that's a that's a very specific problem you've got there, Tim. Um, what what you could do to you bleh, what could you do to fix it? Uh, the first one is is really simple. Make sure that um, you are trying to start the car correctly. And by that, I mean, you'll not have loads of other things in the car that are drawing loads of electricity. So, you know, generally I would say, turn off um, any, make sure there's nothing plugged into the 12 volt socket um, and see if that uh, improves things. Um, you may get to the point ultimately where the next best step is uh, rather than spending time trying to fix something that you, you can't, um, is to, oh, we're getting an interlude here as well. Um, rather than uh, spending time to fix something is, is to go and ask for assistance. So jump starting a car is something that I think everyone should know how to do. Um, just <laughs> remove, it's a nightmare. Um, so jump starting a car I think is something everyone should be able to do. Um, and it's it's really simple process. Um, and that is something that ultimately on a cold morning, you may have to do to be able to get your car going. Um, and the other one, you know, is, is uh, 
then make sure that you've got um, alternative arrangements if you really need to. So know where you know your, your local bus stop or something is. I mean, I, I say that I don't think I would ever. Um, if I got to the point where my car didn't start to go to work, I probably couldn't turn up at work because everyone would you know find that really quite entertaining. Um, but you know, if your car doesn't start, then uh, you just need to be sensible about these things. So the the takeaway I've got is you're pretty much advocating someone to call in sick if their car doesn't start. At least that's what you would do. It seems. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you work in an automotive industry and you can't start a car, then then that's a pretty embarrassing position <laughs> to be in, isn't it? Excellent. I think those are pretty sound advice. Um, again, it sounds like you're basically advocating for someone to get an Uber if their car doesn't start <laughs> as well, um, which I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to go down. But um, I'd love to find out what your favorite jaguar land rover car is that's ever been made and and i guess what's your favorite car ever i think that's um probably a good question to ask someone oh. who's big on cars a very difficult one, sure. i was going to say a, that's a difficult question to ask somebody who likes cars so favorite favorite jlr car um oh that's a difficult question i think i'll probably pick two um one is um the new Defender V8 that we've just revealed um, and purely because that has been my life for the past two and a half years um, you know right from the early stages of, of that program through to the end you know that's that's been something that I've played a, um, a role in I'm not going to say it's a big role but I have I've played a role in that um, and I feel quite passionate about that product um, and the other car is probably the original Range Rover um, which I think is a underappreciated icon of uh, the automotive industry. You know, they were miles ahead of their time. If you look at them now, design-wise, they're really quite impressive. Um, and they opened up a huge bit of the market that continues to grow. You know, they were the first luxury SUV. Uh, and it's quite cool. In terms of favourite ever car, the car I would love to own is a classic Mini. Would love to own a classic Mini. Um, I was always a huge fan of the old Italian job as a film. I thought it was great. Um, you know, it's got Michael Caine is hilarious, which is which is always beneficial. But you know, I'd love the rooftop chases around too. And so I'd love a classic Mini. Um, and I reckon I could just about fit in one. You know, six foot six foot one. I think you can just about fit. You look very much like uh, something out of Mr. Bean or something like crawling out of your car. But I, I think I think you have it there. I think. Uh... A mini is a great car. I kind of expected to go a, li a bit more out, all out and go for something Italian or something like that. But um, no, I think you can't go wrong with a classic mini, can you really? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's interesting uh, getting the opportunity to drive lots of quite powerful and quite fast cars at work, um, not regularly, but occasionally, which is which is a huge privilege. Um, you very quickly realise that, that speed isn't everything because on the road, you can't use it the whole time. But in a mini, you could be flat out everywhere and having a great laugh. Um, and that's more fun. And ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a child at heart. I just want to have fun. Um, and I think that's, that's, what, that's what they give you. So say, save your fast cars, keep them in Lego form, go for the, <laughs> the, the cheap and fun, fun models. Um, I think we're probably getting towards the end of the show now. It's been fascinating to talk to you, James. Um, so maybe just to finish off, it'd be great if we could get some advice um, for any of our listeners out there that might be considering a career in in the automotive world, um, what advice could you give them um, to kind of get a head start in the industry? So the first thing I think I would I would say, and it's something that has done me well, is find something you're passionate about um, and, and try and work out is that is that are you passionate about the engineering? Are you passionate about being able to develop a particular piece and actually have that on all the cars? Are you passionate about actually looking at the vehicle as a whole. Um, you can teach people lots of skills, but you can't teach people passion for something. Um, and that goes across actually any industry, to be honest. Uh, go and find something that you'll, in, you'll enjoy going to work for. Um, that would be a piece of advice number one. Piece of advice number two is um, do a bit of research on any company before you go to the interview. It sounds really obvious, but I think one of the things that helped me when I got into uh, the interview stage for that first placement is saying, oh, you know, I've just seen that you're doing this, or I've just seen you've done, done a press release on, on this. 
um, can you tell me a bit more about it? You know, and if you have made the effort and if you've shown a bit of interest in that, um, you'll actually strike up, you potentially can strike up a good conversation with your interviewer um, and give them something to remember you by rather than, oh, you know, he was the guy who answered these questions. He was the guy I had a conversation about whatever it may be. Um, and I think the third piece of advice um, would be to make the most of any opportunities to try out different areas of the industry. Um, for me, it was a huge learning experience going and doing those three placements in different areas of the business. Um, and it really helped me work out what I didn't, didn't like, but it also gave me the skills so that I could work in one role and know what people in the other role would be doing. Um, so if you've got a particularly uh, company that you want to work for, maybe accept a role in a different area because you'll learn a lot more and be able to get into a, into a role that ultimately is the one that you truly desire. James, again, it's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you. Um, it's been very overdue. We've been trying to arrange this for absolute months <laughs> and I'm glad we've got time. it out of the way now. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute blast to chat to you. Um, where can people find out more about careers, life at JLR and um, where can they find out more about the Defender V8? Uh, I mean, the, the easy answer is the internet, isn't it? Um, so <laughs> I think... Uh, you see, because I do the uh, careers fair, I know this, jaguarlandroverkareers.com. That's where all of our um, careers stuff is. And that's right from um, undergraduate placements, um, apprenticeships, all the way through to, you know, applying for a, a job if, you, uh, if you're just looking for a full-time role. Um, and uh, Defender V8, I mean, that was, that was all over the front page of Top Gear and Auto Car and Piston Heads when it came out. So there's loads of info on it. And, uh, and I really recommend having a look at the videos because the video is a bit drifting. Uh, are just brilliant. Excellent. Um, stay safe, James. Um, yeah, good luck with everything you've got going on in the next couple of months because I'm sure you'll have more things coming out, no doubt. Um, and yeah, I look forward to seeing the spy shots that are completely wrong in the, the coming months. Thank you very much, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to our guest this week, James Grant, for coming on to talk about his experience behind the scenes at JLR. I'm hoping my new Defender V8 is on its way in the post as we speak. If you've enjoyed this week's show, why not consider liking and subscribing or even maybe hitting that bell notification so you never miss an upload. You can follow us on all our socials, just search at JobHunterPod. Or if you fancy coming on the show, why not drop us an email? It's JobHunterPodcast at gmail.com. We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode and tune in next week to find out more about some of Britain's most interesting jobs.